Okay, I'm doing something a little bit different right now, and uh, it's very hard to speak about. I spoke a little bit about how um, religions um, don't know how to really understand how to speak about the soul. So I'm going to do it in a kind of piecemeal way, just kind of based on some kind of anecdotal story that happened to me that I'm trying to wrap my head around. And because sometimes being able to speak about something, even if it's kind of piecemeal, helps my brain kind of organize the ideas. And then from there, maybe I'll be able to make a coherent story about it. So from what I know of eschatological stories is that um, we are the embodiment of a soul. And it's so it's one soul and it's diversified around the world in many diverse kind of constructions or uh, creations. So if God promises in the Quran, for example, that everyone will be saved who believes in oneness and tries to say that or understand how to live that sincerely. So there's no saying that that state of mind and that sort of resonance that you witness remains with you for your entire lifetime. And that's basically God's mercy in a way because grappling with the zeitgeist and with your society and with life and work, we kind of don't have that time to embellish what that meaning could become, right? Like how do, how do I live spiritually and with integrity and with aligning with how I understand the universe if I haven't done the work to try to understand that because I didn't have the time to. And because I kind of take for granted that I'm born into this family um, that reveres this way of life but doesn't hasn't really studied it in any kind of depth to keep it uh, correct practice. So they're orthodox by um, trying to understand that we want the doctrine to remain in our family, but we haven't evolved with it uh, in any kind of contemporary way. So the spirit of it has kind of dissolved out, which is the practice of remaining spiritual and finding ways in the universe to maintain a sort of um, compassionate understanding of how to live with each other. And all that remains is just the doctrine, which is follow these rules and follow these precepts and don't step out of, outside of that. So trying to live that existence in a contemporary world right now that's postmodern is it's just going to look so dry. Nobody's going to want to actually remain in that kind of mindset or mind frame. So how would you resolve to these people who don't know how to identify that yet, that you need to change the way you're thinking about your context while assuming that just because you said or you witnessed something that's true um, that it will be enough to save you in a large way right so this is going back to hierarchies and how people who struggle uh, the most tend to have a higher degree of recognition with God so there are degrees of excellence with God it's not to say that people are elitists um, in being able to identify um, where they might be with God because nobody can actually say that. We can't say that just because you know, you've know you made this stride in life or you have this understanding that you have any particular right to speak about something with any kind of authority. This is something that God gives to people and we don't know what that community actually ends up being or who they represent or where they come from. So it's actually... Uh, tends to be counterintuitive. And that's what we know at the time of the Prophet, is that the community in Medina that was Jewish, they were studying and trying to understand, like, what are the characteristics that we need to look for um, in the next Prophet that kind of arrives. And they didn't think that it would come from an Arab, I think, from an Arab community. So they struggled with that zeitgeist. Like, they already have an idea in their mind that when someone actually did arrive to almost confirm what they're looking for and what they're trying to understand is going to be something to believe in, they couldn't kind of make that, make that mind shift to jump into, oh, well, maybe we understood it wrong and this is who we're looking for. Some did, from the Jewish community, um, embrace his, uh, his, his way of life and accepted him. Others did not. And some of them became... Um, hypocrites trying to understand like if I'm on this side and then they go on the other side and that was a community that ended up being treacherous and so um, the prophet didn't know how to judge them as himself so uh, in one of the scuffles I think it was the trench the battle of the trench he actually recruited someone from within their community and said how would you treat this treachery and so they exiled them they just said instead of killing them or taking their women as captive 
um, and and their goods will just exile them so basically they were given I think a night to just gather their belongings and find a different place to settle because the coexistence just couldn't couldn't be made to happen so um, it's it's kind of it's a difficult it's a difficult conundrum and I think that that's what we come up against with with pluralism is that we want to have an overarching kind of uh, way of saying but we've we've been through history with all these different religions all these different uh, historical figures or prophets with their miracles and their scriptures and we need to now have a secular approach which is to say we're not going to write it off but we're not going to allow anybody to say with any kind of authority that there's only one way to exist because that basically eliminates all the diversity that we've kind of worked towards building so back to the point of I mean, how, how do people who wa were from, for example, that Jewish community or current day Muslim community who were born into a Muslim tradition, but they don't do any of the, um, the methodologies that, or they don't follow any of the methodologies that sort of keep them understanding what the faith and the doctrine is and then how to evolve with it and how to maintain a spiritual path without feeling like you have to be self-righteous about it or promote yourself in any way as you know our book is the correct one and and kind of go about it in that rhetoric so um i want to say that i want to integrate the christian belief of believing in jesus will save you so what we know in the muslim tradition is that he is the spirit of god and even though he was in a corporal body god raised his spirit and uh in so doing allowed uh, some kind of misinterpretation of his existence, right? So it's almost like we, we can't really identify what happened. But some will say that he died for our sins, meaning that because he went, it's almost to say he went through a lot of different scenarios that um, maybe for that context, created persecution and created a type of divide between uh, Judaism and Christianity that like we like in, because Judaism is known to be very very um, built on very strict laws and if Christianity came or, or Christ came to kind of alleviate some of that and people were hesitant to kind of step into that but continued anyway to kind of relieve itself of maybe all those difficult um, doctrines and beliefs and ways of existing then you can say that he died for our sins because it's not really a sin as it were people assume it's heretical but it's if it's god who's saying i'm trying to evolve with you into civilization and postmodern life to make things easier because look like your your ideas of life and government and how to coexist are making things easier by by nature so why not let go of the doctrine like you don't need all of it all you need is a spiritual idea of the universe how to maintain that throughout life while going to work and living your life and uh, allowing your family to kind of try out different identities and then try to also uh, almost like cooperate with other people from other cultures right so if god's it's almost like sometimes the the, the, the argumentation is why won't god come and talk to us but it's like God is in everybody, and this very like the very progress of all these people moving out of very very ancient ways of practicing into the contemporary world is God saying you're allowed to do this. Like this is the nature of going into like enlightenment, as it were, like the kingdom of heaven or or heaven itself, where these rules don't really exist. And I remember when I was in I think grade three, um, I had a. Uh, we had a school that we used to go to as a language school. Um, so it used to help us within, I guess, a lot of communities in Canada maintain our mother tongue. And so we, it was strictly the, we used to go on Sunday mornings and it used to be uh, just the Arabic language that we used to practice. And it was just that community of people that I think was from like 10 to one o'clock. And then after we left, I think there was an Asian community. So I don't know, maybe the Mandarin. But anyway, the very idea of it was, to me, I took for granted that we're just allowed to do this. But I'm glad that it um, it looks normal to me. And I hope that it does. Because understanding the importance of speaking another language isn't something that's experienced until you can. Because you begin to think in uh, a broader way. 
So, for example, I know that when I was struggling with um, speaking Arabic with like family and like in the past, my mind would shift to English, right? And I'd find the word and then I'd try to in- explain it in Arabic. So my mind just became very slow. But I learned how to understand depth and meaning because sometimes you'll have an English word that doesn't quite satisfy the meaning you're trying to bring with an Arabic one and vice versa, right? So it's you end up speaking like this mishmash of two languages. And if the other person speaks both languages, it's almost to your advantage because then misunderstandings are less likely to kind of arise. So um, building on that, if we say that Jesus kind of lived for our progress and continues to, then it's not that God sacrificed himself. It's that God is enabling us to make use of the intellect and the faculty of discernment that he's ennobled us with to begin with. So imagine now that we believe in the archangel and he is known as the messenger angel. So he's the one that comes into the world. Um, some believe in specific um, seasons in, the war- in, 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 in a year, for example, than in others. But God also says that the last third of every single night he comes down almost to the last heaven. So like the most closest sky that we can maybe kind of abstractly and metaphorically kind of envision. And he almost extends a hand saying like, who who's there that wants my guidance or wants my forgiveness or has maybe done something during the day that they regret and want guidance in and out of to alleviate kind of like a, a personal conundrum or personal conflict. So think of that as the archangel. Now, we don't necessarily have to uh, assume a way of seeing what he would look like because the prophet himself explained that he, when he would see him in his full form, he would span the east and the west. So basically he would, it's just blinding, like you can't see anything else and it would be a terrifying experience. And I can, I can relate to what that would be because we always think of anything that's awe-inspiring as uh, something we'd want to become. Like you just think like, wow, imagine having that kind of impact in the world. And I don't know where that comes from. But to assume uh, any kind of reverential mind space, it actually brings you down. It really humbles you. And so it's it's actually counterintuitive. So if you think of just going out in the night sky um, and observing, especially with like a microscope, Sorry, not a microscope. <laughs> what well, we would be microscopic from that perspective, but with um, a telescope or binoculars, you really get a feel for how um, how small we can feel. But in spite of that, we're given so much uh, reverence, and God God lifts us in such a significant way in Scripture. Like He says, "I've created you in such a ennobled way, and I've honored you." And I've, I've created ways for you to exist in the world and continue to progress with technology. So like I, I help you um, travel across waters with something that looks as good as it does. Like when you look at cruise ships, for example, right? That's a magnificent, you can say that that's a, like a magnificent creation, right? If you think of where we started and where we've become, it looks like, wow, cool. And then airplanes and then going up into space and all of that. So that to me is a way of God saying, I'm going to help everybody achieve the spiritual aim that they're working towards, but it's not going to look as orthodox as it might have 8,000 years ago, for example. So what we need to understand from an orthodox perspective is that that us, them narrative that we tend to attribute um, to people who don't look like they're practicing in any kind of religious way needs to dissolve. It really needs to go away because if we already assume that with progress, people have already left all these doctrines behind, they are actually more progressive than the orthodox ones, I want to argue, because they, they've they left all that baggage and they're trying to live in a kind of symbiosis with everybody. And they don't have that narrative of we're doing it more correctly than you. They don't have that kind of righteous or self-righteous haughtiness that's like, I know I'm going to heaven and you're not. Like, from, where do you get off? Like, no. <laughs> right? So... If God is allowing people who are within that Orthodox tradition to assume that even though you're holding on to doctrine, it's not going to diminish from you in any way. So then he does maybe come into their life through these practices to help them out of, for example, their their really strict practices. But the fallback here is now the community that's dominant that tries to hold them back and say, oh, wait, you're going back into like heresy and don't go, don't progress. So then it becomes... 
a personal conundrum as well as a community conundrum. Like, how do we allow an Orthodox community to move forward without feeling like it's going to be losing something substantial? Because if you think God doesn't leave, like, we're living, so in, like, the very definition of our existence, we have a spiritual inclination to continue to wonder and, and contemplate life. So what's there to lose other than to constantly remember that we should remember to be humble with the universe. Like we shouldn't try to um, over affiliate some kind of power or prowess about God in any way, or like any kind of domineering way of saying this is the way to practice and then try to instill that as a, as some kind of political rule. Um, outside of that, I think, uh, I don't know. I really don't know how to explain how souls can, can move around and how um, dreams can kind of overlap into that. But it's, I talked a little bit about how time can expand and constrict. So if we are living in one lifestyle, or sorry, one lifespan, and for example, um, I don't know very much about Yom Kippur and, and the Jewish tradition, but in Islam, we have something called the night of power, which is in the ninth lunar month. Typically when Muslims fast for nine months from sunup to sundown. And it's known that that's a time where God has chosen, um, as he chooses, just to kind of create distinction in the world as a construct to think about, um, that this archangel is present and more likely to remain present, right, for that duration of the month. And so it's almost during this time that you can kind of uh, put in the effort to kind of build your own destiny, as it were. So kind of... Um, almost assuming that because uh, there's a likelihood that my prayers will be answered or that my ideas will align with some inspiration, then why don't I put the extra effort to kind of build that into my life, uh, even if it is just for that month. So uh, I want to suggest that that spirit, it can visit, like it can almost visit different um, consciousness. So if we think when we sleep, where does our soul go? Imagine it does go to that spirit that archangel and it just all the souls kind of just hang out there because they're already longing for that and the more you long for something the more you find yourself there it's like a way of manifesting as it is so from that regard it's there's no way of saying that your soul is actually going to come back to your body as that original soul you'd actually want it to change because now you're you're trying to align with a different worldview and a different meaning so maybe that's what um i think it's called astral progression uh I don't know, but anyway, Doctor Strange, the uh, the concept of it is kind of uh, illustrated, where there's a spirit in us that can leave and come back, and we have no way of controlling that, unless we start to. I mean, we it is almost a passive understanding of it, but trying to create a conscious understanding of I want to build a goal around reaching some kind of metaphysical understanding and then build my life around that and I want guidance and you're kind of asking the universe for that, then it comes to you. The inspiration just arrives and maybe it comes to you in different forms of souls or consciousnesses in the past that have um, almost built that way of understanding enlightenment. So if you are somehow fortunate enough to have made that kind of internal prayer or you have that internal dialogue or that aim and it's a sincere one, who's to say that someone who's passed away in the past um, will have a soul that will gravitate to you and then you've inherited all that that knowledge basically and that's how inspiration continues to help us progress forward and in a way um it's almost hopeful that it doesn't always contain itself within orthodox traditions and that it's diversified around the world it's not really concentrated anywhere and that does go back to the routinization of charisma is that you never know what idea gets picked up by a significant population that tends to be influential and how it just finds a way of existing in the world and ma maintaining some kind of um, following until it kind of dies off and then it continues somewhere else. So it's almost to expect that there are going to be maladaptive ways of thinking without really understanding why it's considered maladaptive, right? Because if, if you're looking from a lens of postmodernism, it may not be. It may be, oh, this idea really uh, resonates with how we're trying to move forward with pluralism. So we're going to hold on to this and maybe gradually allow um, the ideas in orthodoxy because they might have a very difficult time accepting this um, and vice versa sometimes if it emanates from within an orthodox tradition everyone on the outside for example might say 
you know, to what degree, if we adapt this, are you going to want to kind of take ownership of it, ownership of it and not allow us to kind of make some kind of creative idea around it? So it is a way of trying to coexist without assuming rightful ownership, because that does go into kind of theocracy where it's the rule of God and someone assumes that I am more rightly inspired than anybody else when it's it's supposed to humble you. It's supposed to allow you to be grateful that you have this opportunity in this moment to uh, be someone who's like a recipient of this inspiration and to make an impact in the world that's supposed to help the human race kind of progress in a more pluralistic and kind of uh, helpful way of coexisting. So I think that's where we are right now. The videos that I did are, I think I'm, I'm coming to an end with them. I'm going to, I stopped with poetry just to kind of let whoever might have been following kind of make their own uh, methodology as it were for how they'd want to interpret anything that's kind of new and open to interpretation. And then I'm going to go into scripture and just wonder about oneness and all the different chapters that talk about that. Because if we have that as a foundation, we're already um, more susceptible to not wanting to prove ourselves, as it were, to anybody. Like, I don't have to meet your list of requirements for being Muslim or being Christian or being Jewish. Like, if, and that's that's the narration, you know, if you say, I believe in oneness in a sincere way, then you're saved and you're, you're, you're just going to start to align in a kind of um, compassionate way that is inclusive rather than exclusive and trying to weed people out as though, you know, some are better than others. It's not really the way to live and it's not the way the prophet lived. He was always trying to make excuses for allowing diversity of behavior to exist without saying that the religion will say it's not okay. So keep that in mind and I think you'll enjoy um, this kind of new lens that you can view the world with and then yourself if you're a postmodernist or if you're a secular person and maybe aren't sure how to identify with certain religions but want to maintain something that has to do closer with um, an orthodox tradition that can be viewed from a postmodern lens so almost creating your own unique identity while not completely dismissing uh, what tradition was maybe 2000 years ago or before that.